and chin. The fourth dimension is an interesting thing. You know, we have the three dimensions, height, width, depth. But then you got the fourth, which is time. I like to choose time for the, which it is, has to do with space, invisible. Our Father is invisible to us, and yet he's there. You can count on it. Jesus would say in John chapter 20, verse 29, to Thomas, the doubter, the twin, that you've seen and you believe that's one thing, but blessed are those that have not seen and still believe. That's you. And you didn't walk with Christ. Thomas did. But yet at the same time, you believe, you know that he was, and there's a special blessing for that. You don't ever want to turn loose of that. Always hope for it and strive for it. it is to believe and to have the faith to know even though you can't see you can't see the wind. It blows here and it blows there. You can feel it when it touches your face, but you can't see it unless there's particles or, or precipitation, something like that within it. But you can't see it, but it's there. So you can have the same faith to know that your Heavenly Father, though you can't see into that dimension, that fourth dimension, He's there and just above us, always there. As a matter of fact, it is written that your angel has, if you're one of God's elect, that is, your angel has the face of God at any time that he chooses. That's to say, if you're in problems. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the great book of Colossians, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1, let's pick it up with verse 10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful. That's very important. You've got to be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. If you're not fruitful, you're not much use to God or anyone else as far as that's concerned. 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, not yours, his power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. I don't know, does he share that power with you? If you deserve it, he does. You have that knowledge, if you deserve it, he'll give it to you. It's a blessed thing to have faith and to believe. Twelve, giving thanks unto the Father. Do you always do that? These steps are extremely important. Which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. In light of what? Well, light drives away darkness. Light is truth. Light gives you that knowledge and that wisdom. Light is what makes you fruitful. You're not just some bump on a log out here somewhere. You amount to something. You're useful to your community, to the people that love you. You're fruitful. You produce. You help. You assist. Why? Because you have the power of God within you. Not your power, His. If you're one of his set-aside ones, that's what a saint means, just simply set aside from the norm with knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and producing fruit. And who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? I mean, that translation has already taken place right into the very kingdom of the living God. 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's the beauty of Christianity. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you. Well, you don't understand, brother. You're a second-class citizen. You're a divorcee. Christ didn't say he couldn't forgive divorce. That's a bunch of malarkey. That makes you a second-class citizen, and somebody's playing one-upmanship on you. Christ forgives sin. It's either, it's either real, you either believe that, or you don't. If you don't believe it, well, hey, you're in a bad shape, friend. You're in a heap of hurt, because your sins are not forgiven either. And that naturally puts you in hurt. So 
always know and understand your father loves the children. Everything he did or has done is for you, for the children, always. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of every creature? Though God is in that dimension, which you cannot see unless you're in the transition of death, then when you see Christ, he's in the perfect image. That, that word in the Greek is icon. Looks exactly like him. So you can't, if you believe in Christ, you've seen the Father. Because when you look upon Christ, that is God with us. And that that is invisible to many, though you cannot see, yet he's visible to you through your spiritual eye because you know he's there. Verse 16, for by him were all things created, not just a few, all, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Well, why for him? For his pleasure. If something doesn't give him pleasure, he has a way of cooling it, getting rid of it. So that's all up to you in your life. How are you doing, friend? You doing all right? If you're blessed and if you're fruitful, then you're doing what God would have you do. Otherwise, you're probably not. So only you can tell that, except for God. Though you can't see him, he knows. <clears throat> and when you see trouble in the world, he knows that also. He's very aware of it. You don't have to worry about it. You know something? He's not angry at you. He's angry at those that cross him, that would try to get in the way, that would interfere with his wonderful work. He created all things for his pleasure. You want a second witness to that? It's the last verse of chapter 4, the great book of Revelation. Verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, without him, then tell me what you are. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So it pays great dividends to be in him to have faith in him. Otherwise, I'm sorry, you're a nothing. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Uh, and do you know something? You ever want to join this church? Guess who you have to talk to? You don't talk to me or anybody else, not the board, not the elders. You've got to talk to him because he's the head of this church. If he says you're okay, we're not going to argue with that. We're going to accept you as long as you behave decently and as long as you produce fruit. That is to say, you amount to something in loving the Lord and doing his will. But he is the head. He should be the head even in your family, your life, your everything. Why? Because he created all things. They belong to him. A lot of people will say, I'm going to get around to giving my soul to God. It's too late, friend. Ezekiel 18, 4, all souls belong to God. He's got it right there in his hand. It's his to do with as he chooses. Snuff it or give it life. It's his choice. So don't ever try to limit God. He is the head. He is the Father of all. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him should be all, should all fullness, fullness dwell. 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. He's everywhere, everything. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. He is the top. One more verse. And you, that were sometimes annihilated 
and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. And so it is that our Father reconciles. Why? Don't ever let anyone take that away from you. You're a child of the living God. You don't belong to anyone, and you don't owe anything except to him. Unless you've messed around and got yourself in much trouble and debt and stuff, then you may owe a lot of people, okay? But he is the one that truly you want to owe, because he owns you, if you want eternal life. You see, that's what the fourth dimension is. It's not width, it's not height, it's not depth, it's time. And time has nothing to do on a, with the spiritual body. If you love him, your spiritual body is eternal. It's ever living. It is and will always be eternal life. Turn with me to the great book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. What does the word Hebrews mean? Let's get it straight in our minds. It comes from the word Eber in the Hebrew tongue. It means the people that crossed the river. That's the Israelites, the all 12 tribes. And so they have migrated today. And that, that means you, the house of Israel, not the house of Jew. The house of Judah also, but you be the house of Israel. There are two separate houses. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's your deed. Faith is your deed to heaven. Faith is your deed to things you might hope for. You haven't seen them, but you know it's real, and you know it's there. And you go into that fourth dimension, which is time eternal, forever and ever with the Lord Jesus Christ, with our Heavenly Father. Verse 2, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Um, th verse 3, through faith, what we un though, through faith we understand that the world was framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. It's the way it is. Now, first off, I want you to take that word worlds. In the Greek, it's eons. It means time. It's ages. He didn't change the rets. That's the terra firma. He changed the time. That's the fourth dimension. Okay. Always with time. Ages. The only way you can understand God's word is to understand the ages. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. That is to say, Abel was. His faith still carried him through. You can count on it. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had what? He had this testimony that he pleased God. In other words, he preached about the fallen angels that were seducing the daughters of Adam, trying Satan trying to block the coming of the one, that is to say the firstborn, the only begotten, that's to say the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was one of the only ones that really was a preacher and stood against it. The book of Jude documents that, if you need a second witness. And God saw that he was doing a good work and knew he was going to have to destroy what was there at that time, that area, because of the Geber, the Nephilim, the fallen angels. So rather than destroy Enoch or even translate, he, he just took him out. He was too good for this earth. So he translated him. That's what faith will do for you. Faith in our Heavenly Father. 
not the world, not people, but the living God. Verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That word diligently, diligently in the Greek means sincerely. If you're sincerely seeking him, then your faith is going to be good. Hey, if you don't believe in him, you can pray all you want to. You're not going to get answered. Why? Well, why are you praying to somebody you don't believe that doesn't exist? Only a fool would do such a thing. But to pray to he that you know is there, is solid, that wants you to produce fruit. He's not going to withhold things from you that will further God's word. He will give you that opportunity. You are the one that must do the building, though, not somebody else. In other words, God will give you the bricks to build anything you want to build if it's for him and it's what he wants. But you have to do the building, okay, always. That's the way the cookie crumbles, my friend. For without faith, you're worthless. Without faith, you're not going anywhere. God believes and loves those that have faith in him, though you can't see him. You've seen the Son through his actions, through the history, through the Word of God, his healings, those that he has helped, and even the touch of the Holy Spirit today and answered prayer to those that have faith. You know that you know, and he is so very, very real. All the fourth dimension is awesome in time, and time meaning nothing, for we are eternal. And that eternity is before us to accomplish many, many things. How precious is the word of God that he loves his own. Skip with me now on down to, to the 17th verse. By faith, Abraham, when he was tired, offered up Isaac, when he was tried, rather. He offered up Isaac and... He that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. In other words, God himself, when that time came, he didn't ask Abraham to do something he didn't do himself. He spared Isaac, but he didn't spare his own begotten son. He let him die on the cross. Why? For you. Because his only begotten son was he himself, Emmanuel, God with us. 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In other words, Abraham had enough faith when God told him to put the child on the altar and to sacrifice him. He knew that God had already made the promise that this, through this child, Israel would become as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. So he knew if God even wanted the child sacrificed that he'd, bring him, he'd translate him right back to life and accomplish those things. He had no doubt, in other words. 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. He was 100 years old. He was too old to bear children. So he had already received him. You might as well say from the dead. 20, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And those two became great nations, the superpowers of the end times. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the son of Joseph and the sons of Joseph and were and worshiped leaning upon the top of his staff. 22. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandments concerning his bones. He knew they would be free. He trusted God. He had faith to know that he would do that. 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. 
In other words, they were going to destroy all the firstborn. He was put in a little old basket and put in the Nile, floating down. 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That little basket floated into that Pharaoh's daughter, and she claimed him, raised him. But he still, as his people were enslaved, had the faith and knew the reward was with those people. For, for went all the blessings with Pharaoh's daughter. 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He, he would not have to it. 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Looking forward to that reward, well, what's that? Fourth dimension, time eternal. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And there it is again. Uh, seeing him who is invisible? How could that be? Through faith. 28, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. You've got to remember that blood of the cross. You've got to remember it in your own life. We're coming up on a Passover of the end times. If you're not under that blood, you're in a heap of hurt because many things are going to transpire to those that are not. Those that are under that blood, that are in that covenant, have nothing to worry about. Verse 29, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians assailing to go were drowned. You know, it always pays to serve the Father. I don't care how you reckon it, how you figure it, always go with him, and you'll always be blessed. Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven times, seven being spiritual completeness, and so it was. 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished, not with them that, um, uh, not with, she perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. I, I always have to, I cannot um, let that pass. Rahab was not a harlot. It was just that other businessmen called her one. No. It was because she was more successful at making fine linen than they were. And people travel from far and wide to purchase that linen. And you might wonder, well, how can you document that? Well, it's written in the Bible. Where did she hide the spies? On top of her house? Under what? Stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks and rows and rows of flax from which you make fine linen. Verse 32 to complete. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, uh, and of Samson, of Jephthah, uh, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. Time would just fail of what faith has done for our people. How wonderful it is uh, that our Father does bless us so. And certainly he does. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's the only way it is, my friend. What are the just? Well, those that are justified, those that have overcome, those that have it made. Why? Because God loves them. 
18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Well, how did he do that? Look at nature. Look at God's creation. Quite frankly, don't be deceived. God has never created anything that is abomination. Only man brings forth abomination. God has always created everything in perfectness, basically. And everything having a time and a purpose and a season and a reason whether it be scavenger or whether it be a healthy animal for consumption. It has a purpose. That's why God created it. In other words, you can tell by looking at nature itself what's right and what's wrong. I can put it a little different way. The very nature of your own body, flesh. When you are honest with yourself, even then you know right from wrong with your first instinct. You may not go with that first instinct, but you know that you know. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This applies to people who say, well, they've never heard the word of God. Well, they've seen his creation. They've seen what he's done. They know right from wrong. That doesn't make one one of God's elect, but it makes one know right from wrong. 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. This is why we have wickedness in the world, perversion professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And when you're wise in the ways of the world, sometimes you're nothing but a fool. True wisdom comes from God. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, that's an icon. Did what? They changed it into an icon made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Uh, they, they digressed. Always got to have something they can see. Got to have something they can sell or deceive people with, and they will do it. 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. You don't want to do that. God created things in a natural way whereby you know right from wrong, period. That's the way it is. And uh, that that is perverted is that that goes against God's plan, that makes an icon to fit whatever they want. Let's make us a little God for what? For Let's make us a little God for dancing. Let's make a little God for praying. Yeah, bunch of nonsense. We have one Father, and he created all things both in heaven and in earth. There is nothing else. Why would you take something he created and worship it rather than worship him? You wouldn't if you want to be blessed, I assure you, because all blessings come from those that have faith. And if you have faith in the Father, he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. Last uh, scripture we're going to cover, Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 1, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, 
as we have received mercy, we faint not. It'll strengthen you, it'll keep you going. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, condemning ourselves to, commending ourselves rather, to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And so it is, that's the word of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If there is a veil over it, and they don't understand it, in the simplicity that Christ teaches it, they're the lost ones. In whom, verse 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image, the icon, you can't see God, but when you see uh, Christ, who is the perfect image, icon of God, should shine unto them. He's not invisible when you look at Christ. Don't ever forget that. Verse, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for, Christ, for Jesus' sake. That's the way it is. In other words, Paul and others were a slave to the ministry. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And uh, you are the children of that light. And that light should reflect from you. You are not the light, but you should reflect the light. Christ is the light. But we have the treasure in earthen vessels, these old flesh bodies, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, um, uh, they may see it in you, but it's not you. Okay. They see the light reflected from him, his word, his truth, and it draws people. It leads people. It is precious, for it is our Father. It is the fourth dimension that brings forth that light and that truth, which is knowledge. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Don't let it shake you. Don't let them see you sweat on your first cruise. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Never. Ten, always bearing about the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Uh, and, uh, and so it is that... That's why he protects you when you love him and follow him. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. It may seem like that, but he always protects his own that carry forth the truth. Don't ever forget that. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. In other words, the truth brings you what? Eternal life, fourth dimension, time, time eternal, time forever. 13, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. You can do it. God's word is sure. It will never let you down. The world will let you down. God will not. You can stand assured he will not. That doesn't mean there's not going to be some rough bumps, but so what? You're a child of God. Straighten them out. Grade them out of the road. Clear it down. Pave it. Make it easy. Don't let Satan get away with anything in your life. And always make it easy for others to see the clarity and the simplicity in which Christ teaches. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. You have that assurity. 
that is delivered right into that dimension. If you do know that Christ resurrected, right? Then you can rest assured he's going to resurrect you. The instant that silver cord parts and this clay pot breaks, instantly you're with him, resurrected, transfigured right into, I shouldn't use the word transfigured in that case, resurrected right into the very kingdom of heaven, into that fourth dimension, time, time eternal. How precious it is uh, that our Father is able to do that. And, um, and so there he presents you, 15, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Uh, it's worthwhile. It's all worth it. You may have troubles. You may have heartaches. So what? Handle it. Get over it. Stand up to it and be blessed of the living God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That spiritual, that dimension, it continues on, unseen, but strong. Unheard, yes, heard. I mean leading the way, producing fruit gaining knowledge, gaining wisdom, serving the living God, making a difference, cutting a wake that others can follow, whereby they are blessed with the very word of God because of their belief. Don't ever forget John chapter 20, verse 29, that I quoted from coming out the gate. Old Thomas was a doubter. He had to touch Christ to believe. And Christ said to him, Thomas, you believe because you've seen, but a blessing upon those that believe and have not seen, that's you. You've seen the word. And on believing that, he blesses you. Why? He loves you. That makes a difference. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Um, it, uh, it doesn't, your little bit of troubles in this world don't compare to the glory you have in that dimension. Can't even, you can't even mention it. Has nothing to do with it. Doesn't compare. So don't whimper, whine, or complain when something goes a little bit wrong. Fix it. And fix it now. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Can you see them? For the things which are seen are temporal. It's just a little thing. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Fourth dimension. It's forever and ever and ever. It is our Heavenly Father's kingdom. It is His promise. It is his way. Though that you cannot see, you have faith to believe and to know and to understand. So don't mess around with temporary stuff. Go for the big one. Go for the eternity with the Heavenly Father. But how about, do you just think about yourself? Hmm? Why don't you take somebody along with you? Why don't you help them? Why don't you be fruitful? Why don't you plant a seed of truth where that others can see and can lavish in the beauty and the understanding and the love of Almighty God? And they can join you, and you can have the pleasure of knowing you produce fruit, and you're going to be blessed by Almighty God. Hey, it's worth it. It's well worth it. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the truth. Thank you, Father, for the living word. Thank you for being with us, Father. Let these be a blessing to everyone they come in contact with, Father. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Shouldn't come to, that should have come to me when my father passed. I want to do what my grandparents and my dad 
would have wanted, but I don't want to disappoint or anger God. What does the Bible say about this? I heard a pastor on the radio say that you are not supposed to sue people. Well, he misspoke. You're not supposed to sue Christian people. Anybody that would rip you off from your inheritance is not a Christian. So you can sue them. Now, I, I, but I, I, have you talked to an attorney? Uh, you know, I'm not all that familiar with Kentucky law, but in most states, and I, I believe in Kentucky also, that if a will is not written, then the whole property must go through probate. And naturally, if it were to go through probate, you would receive your just part. So I think you need to check on that. And if somebody shortcutted the, the act of probation, then somebody's in much trouble. You need to talk to an attorney. And um, don't, you're not supposed to sue a Christian. Why? Well, if, if, you, if it is a Christian, you should be able to go to him or her and discuss the situation and come to an understanding without having to pay some lawyer some slick, okay? But now, and, and then if that doesn't cut it, you should take a member of the church to go with you as a witness and discuss it again. If that doesn't work, you are to both Christians to agree on an honest arbitrator. That's another Christian person to decide between the fact without paying some lawyer some slick. Okay, but if the person is doing something as unchristian as this, you're going to have to go to court. Uh, Shirley from Oklahoma. Shirley, there's only one baptism, and is, I know you love the Lord from the way you write, so your baptism is fine. You, you're in good shape. Uh, Pastor Murray, this is Selma from um, Ohio. I've never heard the question, this question, you refer to our Father and the Son using the original sacred names. I now do this in reverence uh, for the holy names. What is the Hebrew word for the Holy Spirit? And all I could find is Ruach. Well, Ruach is spirit, the, whole, the spirit in the Hebrew tongue, but you, to use the word holy is Kadesh. So, for Holy Spirit in the Hebrew tongue is Kadesh Ruach. Okay. Now, if, if you were to say it in the New Testament from the Greek, it would be Hegios Pneuma. Hegios Pneuma. Um, okay, uh, Eric from Illinois. We have a church leadership that doesn't think it is important to open the Bibles during the service along with pulling with pulling red scripture out of context, people complain nobody is getting anything out of these services. Services are repetitious and boring. Further, we are losing members right and left. I find closed Bibles and pulling scripture out of context is violating scripture. Can you show me in scripture, please, your advice? Well, your advice is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. And, and because, because um, you have um, requested, and because it is so important, let's just turn there for a second. Second Timothy, and let's go with um, uh, chapter 2 of Second Timothy, verses 15 and 16. This is what God's Word says concerning this matter of not opening Bibles in church services. And it goes like this in the verse, 15th verse. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, they will increase unto more ungodliness. That's what going without Bibles will do for you. I hope that helps you. Uh, okay, uh, Ann from Tennessee. I attend a church that believes that any man that has been divorced cannot be a deacon or a pastor. 
I do not believe this is what the Bible tells us, or am I the one that does not understand? I believe if a person asks for forgiveness and the Lord has mercy on us and does forgive that sin, it is forgiven, it is forever forgiven by God. We have several good men that attend our church and would make good deacons, but will never have the chance. This says to me that even if God forgave that person, the church won't. Please explain the truth of this. Well, um, uh, divorce is not the unpardonable sin. And Christ forgives sin. I know that if a person doesn't repent and they wallow in the sin of divorce and never repent and ask God's forgiveness, then they're guilty. But once they become church members, then that would say to me they had repented or should have and that God has forgiven them, no church has the authority then to blame them. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go again with First, first uh, Timothy 4, verse 3. Don't let anyone judge you in marriage or food. If, if you've repented, there's no way they can tell, but God can. So you're absolutely correct. God will forgive them. Now, what they do, they will say, well, a deacon or a bishop could only be a man of one wife. Well, that's all he has. He may have remarried, but he still only has one wife because he had probably sufficient reason to divorce the other or she, him, whatever. But when they repented, it was washed away. And he only has one wife. And uh, that's what, there are reasons even biblically, by biblical law, for divorce. So therefore, uh, he puts aside one and marries. He still has, is the husband of only one wife. And so many people are, well, he's had two women. Well, so big deal. He repented. It's over, done with. He's only got one wife. Pastor Murray, Brian from Texas, is serving in the military breaking God's commandments um, directly or indirectly? Absolutely not. Have you ever read Psalms 144? Do you know what it says? It's a prayer by a military person asking for strength to be able to put the enemy under our feet and uh, protecting our people has always Abraham just took 318 men out and defeated about five nations I mean thump their gourd good do you think God disapproved of that of course not God was the one that gave the enemy into their hand so it is an admirable thing to serve our nation. These rights we have of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to travel as you so choose, they don't come cheap. They've been paid for by a lot of blood, a lot of sacrifice. Don't ever even dare think about saying that serving in our military is a disgrace or unpleasing to God. He loves them. Bless their soul. Real people. Gail from Virginia, I am amazed at your retention of the word. How long have you studied and were you a chaplain in the war? No, I was, I was a combat Marine. I was not a chaplain. However, I was raised Christ, born Christian, raised Christian, and, um, and, um, uh, it is not necessary to be a chaplain to have to, to love our Heavenly Father. No, I was a combat Marine up at the Chosan Reservoir here in the North Korean War when we had um, a little disagreement with the Chinese and North Koreans at that time in the winter of 1950. It was a cold, uh, quite a battle. And, but my, my retention is a gift from God. I've been studying and teaching God's Word for almost 60 years. And, um, but even with that, the retention is still a gift from God with the ability to teach. Beverly from Florida. Pastor, what chapter and verse states that judgment starts at the pulpit? Thank you. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 
It is time for judgment, and let it begin with us. Let it begin at the pulpit. Why? Because they're responsible for what has been taught, and it should be. This is why that when you set yourself up as a teacher, you better realize what you're biting off because uh, you're responsible for every misleading thing that you would teach. Every person you mislead, you're responsible. So the thing then, don't mislead people. And having good retention of scripture is an enabler to bring that truth forth, but actually it's the Holy Spirit that accomplishes it anyway. So, but. But it is a responsibility, and it's something you need to take very seriously. Deanne from, Deanne from Georgia. I've been studying with you for about two years now, and I'm learning a lot. I believe in my heart that marijuana, sometimes called weed or pot, is an addicting drug, so I no longer use it for pleasure. My husband says it is not a drug. Please clarify this. I've, I'll be listening and waiting for your answer. Well, it brings about hallucination. Therefore, it is a drug. And what God has to say about drug users is um, sorcery. Because the word translated into the English sorcery in the Greek is pharmaceutica, which our word pharmacist comes from. It. You use drugs, you're not going to be in heaven. Uh, that that's just very serious thing. Why? Well, uh, well, how can you say that? Well, because that's what the God's word says. It says very clearly in in Revelation chapter twenty one, in heaven there will be no sorcerers. That's pharmaceutica. That is to say, people that get a high spiritually from using drugs. You're not going to be there. You're not going to make it. So that's why you want to stay away from that sort of thing. It's a very serious thing. It's real easy to prove me wrong. All you have to do is take a strong concordance, go to, go to the, the um, very word that I mentioned, sorcerer, and see what it says in the Greek. It's a drug user. You don't need drugs to get high. You need God's Holy Spirit. And then you have eternal life. Otherwise, you're doomed for hell. Elizabeth from South Carolina, can you tell me where in the Bible is the vehicle with people mentioned? Please explain what the scripture means. Well, it means that Ezekiel saw a metal, highly polished bronze vehicle. It, ha it was circular, and it didn't look where it went. It just, like an ox cart would, or a horse, it just went wherever it wanted to. And there were w windows in it, and there were people in there, and when it turned, the people turned, naturally, or they would have fallen out. He, he gives a pretty good description for a country boy. Ezekiel does. Z Ezekiel chapter 1. Okay, this is uh, uh, Colleen in Pennsylvania. I have been looking for a passage I have heard you quote several times. In the end times, your leaders will have the minds of children. I'm sure it's somewhere in the Bible, but I can't find it, even using my strongs. But Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4. Okay? Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4. And we've come to that time. Uh, Sue from Tennessee. You are doing Genesis now, and I have a question. On page um, 1150 or 150 in the Strong's Concordance, the word was says, uh, see preface, uh, which says, if no, my, well, wh I'll tell you what you want to do. The word was, let me tell you what it is. It is the number 1961. I'll say it again. 1961 in the Hebrew dictionary. And the word is become, uh, became rather. And it is the word utilized in that second verse there in um, the, the word was is used so many times in the manuscripts that they, they b basically lump it together. And, but that 1961 is the Hebrew number of the word was as it was utilized in the first chapter of the great book of Genesis. 
Doyle from Tennessee, I've been taught most of my life of the rapture. I've believed for years that there was more to the Bible than was being taught. I thank God for leading me to your TV broadcast. I love God's Word as you teach it. My question is, is it wrong for a preacher to preach redemption to a congregation of believers? God bless you and your staff. It is wrong for a preacher to teach a salvation message to everybody that's saved. You need to give them meat, scripture, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, something they can hang on to. Uh, and so it is. I I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it.